So now knowing some basics of Earth's energy budget, we want to move on and build on that by talking about the structure and composition of Earth's atmosphere. So we can see behind here this nice NASA image taking a long shot across part of Earth's atmosphere. And talking through some of this material is going to help us answer some basic questions you may have had uh, throughout when you look up at the sky um, and go through a day and see the sky and, and think, okay, well, why actually though is the sky blue or why are sunsets, sunsets red? So we're going to talk about one of the processes that is related to that. And when talking about our um, atmosphere, get us in the mood, since we're going to be going up into the atmosphere, we're going to make sure that we don't want to be brought down. And so our song for this video to get us in the mood, talking about more about the atmosphere, is Don't Bring Me Down by Electric Light Orchestra. So there's several ways that we can talk about arranging the atmosphere or essentially layering it to study it. Um, and three common ways are either by the atmospheric composition, uh, the atmosphere's temperature, or the atmosphere's function. And I'm not really going to talk about the composition here. I will at least mainly be focused on temperature um, and also some a lot of function uh, throughout some other lessons and lectures. Um, but here showing temperature. Uh, we have four divisions generally based on that for layering. So troposphere is the lowest. Uh, then moving up, we have stratosphere, mesosphere, and thermosphere. So we can see that on our image here on the right. And we have a red line here that traces our temperature. So this one here. So we can see through our troposphere, we generally have a decreasing temperature as we go up in elevation. And actually then kind of a stabling off and even a little bit of an increase in the stratosphere, and then decreasing once again in temperature up in the mesosphere as we go further and further out. So mainly we're going to be focused on the troposphere, uh, a little bit on the stratosphere as well, um, because I mean, the troposphere especially, when you start talking about weather, um, is going to be the main place where all that weather that we think of day to day is occurring. Now the stratosphere um, is also important because it's tied to the function uh, of a couple of spheres, uh, or particularly the ozonosphere. Uh, we also can term by function, uh, kind of an outer layer. We term the ionosphere that is important. It's kind of quite high up, um, well beyond our normal reaches, um, where we normally are, are traveling even you know, many, many kilometers, um, you know, 70, 80, 90 kilometers out uh, from Earth's surface. Um, this upper layer is really important because um, some of the electrical type fields there uh, absorb and block ionizing uh, very short wavelength radiation. So the, the very few gamma rays and x-rays on that electromagnetic spectrum that the sun does actually emit um, are kind of absorbed there, and dealt with there, um, that otherwise um, would be you know, lethal or at least very harmful to us um, living beings if those were not um, were actually dealt with within the atmosphere and not really reaching the Earth's surface. Similarly, in the ozonosphere, which is a lower sphere within, kind of tied to the stratosphere, this lower layer where there's a high concentration of ozone in this layer, um, which once again absorbs uh, relatively dangerous uh, UV radiation. So we'll talk more about that in another lesson specifically tied to ozone and why that's so important. So knowing, and, and just also to I always bring back to that idea a little bit of how do we know some of these things? Well, um, we know about temperatures and some composition basics in or of the upper atmospheres, uh, mainly because of instruments that we release uh, that go up into high altitude balloons. Um, also, more tied to the stratosphere, we've seen in recent years a number of stratospheric jumps, um, kind of mix of both daredevil and scientific discovery. Um, in recent years, so um, one was in 2012 with Felix Baumgartner actually jumping for Red Bull Stratos, which is a product or a project, excuse me, um, interested in studying more of the Earth's atmosphere. Um, and then Alan Eustis, uh, an executive for Google, interestingly enough, um, also a, a jumping even a little bit higher than than Felix in 2014. Um, and so both those projects you can search more about as well. Um, but those are going to also they have again, kind of a tide fun element, but also um, some scientific research that they're interested in, in as well. So um, moving really from that, you know, 
we have been focused more specifically on atmospheric composition. Again, we're going to be focused more on the lower layers of the atmosphere. Um, we're going to have a more homogeneous mixing or composition uh, of our gases, and so or, so homogeneous being equally mixed. And so we can see here from this picture on the right hand side, I'm um, showing our, we have kind of this greater full extent circle on the upper half, and then kind of showing the few trace gases, um, uh, or, or very small percentage of gases on the lower part. So we can see that the nitrogen, oxygen, uh, and argon are the most abundant gases. Really, nitrogen and oxygen far away make almost the whole composition percentage-wise of the atmosphere. Um, but other gases that still are important uh, that are within the atmosphere being things like carbon dioxide, water vapor, uh, methane, so that's the CH4 on the bottom is methane, CO2 is carbon dioxide, O2 is oxygen, N2 is nitrogen. If you're not familiar with your chemical symbols, um, H2 is hydrogen, for example. If you can go look all that up, though, uh, those all all based off the periodic table for, for chemic for chemical uh, you know, for chemistry um, but so just some things there um, to note kind of the composition and again we'll bring, come back to ozone and why that's important uh, for absorbing absorbing ultraviolet radiation um, so we these are usually broken or, or can be broken into kind of two categories as well uh, of what we can term constant gases versus variable gases. And so the constant gases are really those that make up also the majority of the atmosphere. So just as we looked at in the last slide, the nitrogen, oxygen, argon, um, versus variable gases that are generally those more trace elements. And so the constant gases, where they determine it that way, it would be that because there is little variation year to year, they're relatively homogeneously mixed. And also the note that I have down at the bottom of the slide, so they really they may be able to change over very, very long time scales, and what I mean by that is time scales well beyond our individual lifetimes. So I'm talking thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of years, um, where we might see more greater change in that composition. Really, the, the, ch the composition we have at present day, the evidence we have to back that up, and we'll get to that later when we talk about long-term climate. Um, but really, the idea there is um, really the composition we have reached today has relatively remain stable with those constant gases where with variable gases we see a larger variation in day-to-day -day or year-to-year -year composition and they can be more heterogeneously mixed within the atmosphere so for example carbon dioxide has a little bit more spatial and temporal variability on day-to-day -day, kind of month to month up to year to year so I have a video linked here uh, running through a year uh, cycle of carbon dioxide and where we see greater or lesser extents of that um, and you can watch that video that is linked here and also within this equivalent lesson. So this brings us then back to some processes we've a little bit already touched upon in the last lesson. Uh, where, so we had reflection and absorption and we'll also add another one here we're just to talk, look at reflection and bring back this Earth's energy budget reminder here so reminder that some of that incoming shortwave radiation uh, coming from the sun is reflected by gases and other particulates within the atmosphere. So things like uh, fine dust, for example, that are able to float up uh, in the atmosphere. And But to note that that's a relatively small percentage. We do also have some more of that percentage um, that is also reflected by clouds. And we'll also be looking at that at another lesson within this module. So we'll to add in another process, which is really important here, and again, brings us back to some of these questions that I posed at the beginning of this lecture. Um, so atmospheric scattering, which then this case refers to the redirection of incoming that incoming solar radiation again by gases, water vapor, or, or other particulates in the atmosphere. And to note that this means that the wavelengths of this energy is not changed. And so this is not like absorption or absorption actually takes the energy in, and then once it's re-emitted at a different wavelength, and this is simply a, more of a redirection. Some, in some sense of that uh, incoming solar radiation. But to note that here that shorter wavelengths generally are scattered more. Um, and so we see by this image on the right hand side that with that kind of spectrum of incoming light, uh, a visible light uh, as part of the electromagnetic, electromagnetic spectrum, um, we end up seeing here that really the values that are Kind of they're in highest frequency or have the shortest wavelength there. So actually, when we term the term violet light, generally gets scattered out within the atmosphere. 
Um, but blue light is, is it also has a lot of scattering, but is what is able to at least get down to, to the surface, and oftentimes is what reaches our eye, and thus we in part you know, that's going to tie to why we see the sky as appearing blue. And similarly, um, you know, well, okay, yes, that's why the sky maybe appears blue in the daytime, but you know, we could further then pose the question of why oftentimes do sunsets or you know sunrises appear red, and this is simply because once we move to having the sun very low in the sky, so as you see in this image here, um, we end up having the sun rays, or, you know, that radiation from the sun, having to travel through much more of the Earth's atmosphere, and because of that, all that really, a lot of that blue all is scattered out before it reaches us, and so only those longer wavelengths that are not scattered out as much reach our eyes more, um, so those reds and oranges, as we can see here, and so um, this photo is um, from a friend actually also even showing, you know, you may have even seen this, um, this is actually um, showing at time a sunset with a big wildfire uh, in the area. And so, you know, you may have seen this as well, where it's really some of those spectacular sunsets or sunrises you get. And even you can see kind of more oranges or reds during the day if you're really close to, say, a wildfire and there's a lot of particulate matter in the air that's scattering all of that light. Um, you can have a lot more vivid color and these sunrises, sunsets, or even during the day, because of that that scattering that's going on. And then finally, uh, that uh, another process we've talked a little bit about prior, uh, bring us to atmospheric absorption, um, and so this brings us to this idea you may have heard in the past. You know, hopefully, you've been introduced to some effect to, um, this concept of thinking of Earth as a greenhouse, um, in the sense that um, you know greenhouse operates where light comes in through the window. Again, the short wave radiation is able to penetrate through windows and glass, um, but it's maybe absorbed by the ground or absorbed by plants within that greenhouse when it's re-emitted at longer, those longer wavelengths. Those longer wavelengths, heat energy uh, cannot escape out through the glass, uh, just like that incoming short wave radiation could. And so the Earth kind of acts analogously to that, you know, acts in a similar type of way. Of course, we talked about Earth's energy balance and in the last lecture, and how you know, the Earth has to, of course, lose out approximately you know, just about as much energy as it's bringing in, in the sense that you know, otherwise we would overheat, or um, you know, conversely, if we lost out way too much, we would um, you know, freeze um, across the whole Earth's surface well past any probably extent of um, just being able to maintain life. But all to bring this together, in terms of, again, bring us back to absorption, um, you know, in terms of idea of a greenhouse, you know, the simple answer here is yes to some effect. If there are more greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, uh, there will be more heat that will be re retained and the atmosphere will warm. And so we will come back to this idea and discuss it out more in detail and when we talk about climate and we talk about global warming. But you know, for a little bit more of a complex answer, at least start us moving in that direction. So we'll have at least some basis to come back to when we discuss those topics more in detail. Um, we can uh, understand start to understand how greenhouse gases absorb long-wave radiation in what we term the atmospheric window. So, this, so the idea here is that this long-wave radiation that we know is outgoing from Earth's surface can be absorbed by different types of greenhouse gases and we've already talked about or will come to talk about some of these uh, more in detail. So things like water vapor, carbon dioxide, methane, other greenhouse gases. Um, these, they are very good at absorbing uh, and re-radiating long wave uh, radiation. And so we can see by this image on the bottom here, comes from uh, NASA, where we have this, these color areas essentially filled in here with water vapor and carbon dioxide, uh, where those gases already are absorbing and counter radiating across uh, a, a spectrum of different wavelengths. Uh, again, that are relatively long uh, wave radiation wavelengths, and so you know, eventually we can think we can see both uh, the, here the uh, water vapor and then carbon dioxide areas here uh, that are colored in in different colors there. But then we can think of these white areas where we're not seeing an absorption, so we're showing absorption here on the left hand side from zero on the bottom up to 100 percent. At the top, you can think of some of these white areas that we see here. You can see this term here, the water vapor window. We have this extent of area uh, that it, where 
there really isn't absorption occurring, uh, relatively little uh, absorption occurring in those um, windows. So we can turn on the atmospheric window where energy that is of those wavelengths is, is what is mainly escaping out, uh, or you're making its way out of Earth's atmosphere, and is what we're losing as part of that long wave radiation. So however, we can note that, you know, to tie it back to what we just discussed a few slides ago, we notice, you know, at, at present we see, you know, carbon dioxide has relative, a very small percentage of you know, total composition within Earth's atmosphere. Um, at present, uh, that fluctuates a little bit annually and um, you know, has been generally growing, uh, as we'll come to see in a future lecture. Um, you know, presently sitting about 400 parts per million. So to me, to, so essentially to say that for every 400 molecules of uh, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, there is one million uh, total air molecules. Um, and of course, as we just saw a few slides ago, most of that is nitrogen and oxygen. Um, but just to say that there's that very, very small percentage of carbon dioxide. And, you know, but as we add more and more by burnt, doing things such as burning fossil fuels, uh, or adding other greenhouse gases, they essentially are being added into some of these areas um, that right now are not are, are acting you know as, as the atmospheric window, and so essentially they're able to they're what they're doing is you know making there's more so there's more and more counter radiation or radiation back towards Earth's surface. There's not as much escaping of that long wave radiation in those atmospheric windows, and really then what we can end up seeing, as is shown by now this image on this slide where we will conclude for this lecture. Um, you know, we end up seeing here on the left-hand side kind of our initial condition. When we add in then more greenhouse gases, we eventually have, again, more counter-radiation, or we have more radiation being kept within Earth's atmosphere. So we have less energy that is kind of coming out. So now we're at an imbalance between that incoming and outgoing radiation. Really, the only way to get back into balance to make sure um, you know, that we then we're keeping that balance is for temperatures then to rise, as we see over here on the right hand side, uh, within the atmosphere, um, that which then helps stabilize this incoming and outgoing of radiation. So that wraps us up for this lecture and the main processes that we wanted to talk about with atmospheric composition.